Live. Oh, we are live. live, live from Harvard, Massachusetts, and from Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, this is John Mark Walker. I'm here with Professor Gerald uh, uh, Friedman from uh, UMass Amherst. How are you doing, Professor Friedman? I'm fine. Thank we you so much. Live, live, live from. Wait, Harvard, hang on a second. I have a leaky uh, this is John mic. Mark Walker. I'm here with Professor Gerald. Uh, uh, um, okay, here we go. My apologies, technical difficulties, but we're 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 done with that. Okay, so the reason we're here today is because uh, Professor Friedman uh, is at the center of a huge controversy around uh, his published numbers around uh, Bernie Sanders' economic plans. So, uh, what possessed you to to dive into Bernie Sanders' numbers and uh, create the firestorm that's erupted around you? Well, I certainly didn't intend to create the firestorm. Um, I was curious about the numbers. Um, the Wall Street Journal uh, back in the summer of 15 ran an article about how expensive the Sanders programs would be for the federal government to spend a trillion dollars, trillion dollars um, over 10 years. Uh, so I was just curious. Um, I thought they, their numbers were. Well, inaccurate in the sense that they didn't take account of the money spent would be money spent with the federal money, federal money be spent, and take account of the dynamic effect. If you spend a lot of money, you increase the economy. Explain how that works, because you know when a lot of people think of the amount of money needed to implement Sanders' programs. They're, they're thinking, well, that's going to rise, that's going to increase the deficit, increase the debt, uh, and then we'll be paying for that in the future in the form of higher taxes. So how does that work in practice when you have government programs of that size? Well, this is the fundamental issue well, that, that divides Keynesian economists from other. From you know, what Keynes himself called classical. classical. The classical economists believe the economy operates at the level it operates. With full employment full and can't do very anything much. You can't pump up crime, spend money, and spend money people to work more or invest more. You just have to live with it. So if the government spends money, it has to come from somebody else to spend it. The Keynesian approach is that there's unemployment out there. There are people who would like to work, but can't find them because nobody's hiring. And also, if you get the economy to a higher level of output, then people will invest, people will sell from out of the woodwork to work more hours. Um, so you can actually raise the level of output. So from a Keynesian perspective, if you have unemployment, and right now, I would estimate that the U.S. economy is operating at more than ten percent below capacity. If you look at ten percent, if you look in two thousand seven. The projection what we would be able, what we would, we would be producing now. We're producing about 10% below that. Now, the you know, people like the Romans would be They say, no, we have a, we're much closer to capacity because they have adjusted downward their estimate of capacity in line with what's happening to the economy. So they, by their estimates, we always have pretty full employment because whatever level of output we have is what they think the economy is capable of producing, more or less. So government spending, maybe we'll push it up a little bit, but basically government spending is coming out of private spending. From my perspective, okay. If we come from if we spend money, if I get you, um, John, you'll go out and you'll spend more time on the people. You'll buy more cookies and more tickets to stock events and more computer equipment. And that will get other people. And that will get other people. And businesses will invest more to meet this demand. 
and the whole economy will expand. And the whole economy will expand. Once the economy is expanding and people are working, they will become more productive. Learn by doing, by discovering and developing new skills, and through investments in these kinds of equipment. So the whole level of the economy will go up, and the growth rate will can up further. That's the Keynesian approach, and that's what I thought. Of. That's what I do. What? Why is that such a controversial statement? Because ever since you came out with this uh, report, you've been kind of pilloried from from all all sectors. Uh, Paul Krugman has weighed in multiple times with you, uh, as have uh, Christina Romer from uh, UC Berkeley, uh, Brad DeLong, your former student. Uh, lots of people have weighed on this. Why is this such, creating such a buzz? Well. I can't really speak for their motivations, but I think intellectually there's a huge divide which parallels the political divide. The Hillary Clinton campaign, and I say this as a supporter, I donate money to Hillary Clinton, I also support the Hillary Clinton campaign has been premised on the idea that we can't do a lot better than we're doing now. So, how does she respond to Bernie Sanders' call for universal health care? She said, we can't do this with the next two. Uh, how does she respond to this college law? It's too expensive, we can't do it. So, a lot of what's going on from the liberal section of the Democratic Party, um, you know, the moderate and liberal section, the Wall Street Democrats, a lot of what's going on is them saying, what well, we can't do better. And for people who have been working really, really hard for seven years to enact the Obama administration's program, that's kind of comforting. Right. Because a lot of people are disappointed. Yeah, you know, they wish we could have done more. So right. now I come along and say, well, okay, we'll just get universal health care and we'll spend trillion dollars on infrastructure, we'll fix all the roads, and all we need to do is like Bernie Sanders, wave our hands, and everything will be great. So I think that they kind of get a personal, they might get a personal thing, but certainly there's a pile of it. Um, I'm saying people should get together, mobilize, push this country in a different direction, and we can do a lot better. There's a politics that goes with the economics. Um, just like there are politics that goes with their economics. Well, let's try to tweak around the edges, do little things, because we can't do big things. So I say if you, look if you want at, to do big things, you can do big things. If you look at the rumors analysis, they're basically saying that after a couple of years, the effects will wear off and uh, yeah. production will go back down. What, what, what's your response to their uh, criticism? Well, um, they are, first of all, assuming full employment or something close to it. You know, like I said, they work in the classical field. Everybody who wants to work, or almost everybody who wants to work, has a job. So if you spend money on the government program, if you can hire some people, but where are they coming from? They would have been working someplace right. else. And second, um, if you do manage to get some increase in employment, it's not going to be sustained because you're already producing pretty much what you can produce. So, so you can't you can't change that. You can't change that. You know, you can't increase the growth rate of the economy. It's right. pretty much fixed. Um, you know. Christina Roma, in when she was head of the Council of Economic Advisors in 2009, projected that um, the unemployment rate would peak at 8%. And then it would drift down on its own without a stimulus. It would drift down, and by mid 2016, we would be back to full employment. Okay. If we had the stimulus, oh, sorry, not 2016, 2012, if we had the stimulus, I, I knew what you meant. then it would, it would speed up recovery by six months. But recovery was going to happen anyway, because 
and from the health perspective, right. the health is always more or less a point for you. Know, you can have something bad happen and you can be low for a while. But it's not it's not gonna be just like if you push the economy with big government spending programs, you might get a little extra help, but it won't last. Because you can't go very different from the um uh, the equilibrium level of employment, which is set by the capacity. The only thing that can happen is if you have a bad recession, you lose investment, people could leave the labor force, skills to the and then you can have a lower level of output going forward. So you can go in one direction, you can match it down, but you can't match it back up. Which leads to an art. You're saying it, it, you're saying it adjusts the baseline. So, yeah, but and, and the congressional budget office did this a couple of years ago. They adjusted down by seven percent that projection of the economy, economy's capacity. Right. Um, you know, I've said that we're eleven percent short. They've already taken care of over seven percentage points of that by just assuming that we can't have that output. Now the question is, since we can ratchet it down, why are we still a big deal? Why are we still a big deal? We've had a lot of recessions. Should we have those recessions again? Should they have growth rate down, 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 down? So now it should be zero or even lower? So let's let's rewind back to 2009. And yeah. we had the stimulus package. Uh, a lot of people were saying, oh, it's not working, it's not working. And then for inexplicable reasons, we pivoted from let's spend money out of this recession to let's 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 uh, chop the deficit for for reasons yeah. that, what do you think happened there what why were the people in power getting the wrong advice well um they're related in both politically and in terms of economic theory first of all um politically the deficit was too small to get us out of the recession, but it was large enough, combined with all the so-called political state uh, uh, stabilizers, because the economy, the federal government has the federal government has that kick in automatically. And most of the right. work of keeping us out of this was in the state board. Um, so we avoided a great depression. That was a wonderful thing. This was not 1930. So that's Obama's administration has to get a lot of credit there. Right. But they didn't have enough stimulus to get us out of the recession. What we did was we got into the And that's what you mean by the, the deficit was too small to get us out of the recession. Yes. It was too small okay. to get us out. It was big enough to prevent the depression. So politically, people were like, wait, this was a failure. This was a failure. Because it didn't get us out of the depression, out of the recession. Instead, it said, hey, wait, you thought we would have eight percent. Instead, we had over 10 percent. Your stimulus must have made things worse, which is ridiculous intellectually. But it was a so that's the politics of the second economics. Remember how they lowered their projections of future growth? What happens when you do that is you lower your projections of future tax revenues. Right. And you increase your projections of future spending on social insurance. Right. So all of a sudden, that the four the deficits on the road became a lot thinner. Became a lot thinner. The projections for what the deficit would be in the future swelled, not because right. of the, the stimulus, but because of the release. So and that's what I think most people don't. That's what I think most people don't get that that the deficit and the debt are a direct result of. The slack in demand and the, the exactly. reduced revenue. Exactly, exactly. When the economy does badly, we get a deficit, and that raises the national debt. And that's a good thing. The government should be doing things to help people when things are bad. That not only helps people, but helps people in the recession. Um, 
by spending money to take money on the economy and reduce the unemployment. Uh, that's a good thing. But, uh, uh, um, um, you know, it gave ammunition to people who were saying that, for political reasons, were saying, oh, deficit spending, the stimulus is bad. Um, so the Republicans were, they had all this extra ammunition to make a point to these real right. scary numbers. You know, I mean, the scary numbers, I mean, the scary numbers were changing the economic forecast. And also, if you get forward, um, everything is a disaster. Because of healthcare costs. Because healthcare and, and, the price of and that was the next very next thing I wanted to get into was was healthcare costs and you know how do we how do we pay for a single payer system or do we want a single payer system? Uh, why you know why do we need to change uh, the healthcare system you know at all? Well, there are several reasons why we should think about a change even after enacting the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act has increased the proportion of the public that's covered by health insurance. That's covered by health. Right. That saves thousands of lives. Thousands of lives. But there are still 30 million Americans without health insurance. Um, and that roughly translates into about 70,000 additional deaths every year. Because okay. people can't afford to go to the doctor. Right. Also, tens of millions of people, well more than 30 million, more like 60 million people, um, between 60 and 90 million people have inadequate coverage. They have high deductible plans, they have high right. co pays, um, and that keeps them from going to the doctor or receiving needed services. That right. translates into about 200,000 additional deaths every year. So the first reason we need change is because the current system is killing us. We have close to 300,000 people a year by denying them access to health care. Um, you know, that's the losing um, uh, the American Civil War every three years. In terms of the number of people dying, but, so but, that's but when you get into so when you get into the uh, details about you know, so Obamacare is what we have for better or worse. Uh, it hasn't covered everyone. Um, healthcare costs are still rising. Uh, how do we get from that to an actually sustainable plan? Well, that's the second reason why we need to change. Because what we have now is not sustainable. Uh, what we right. have now is not sustainable because there's nothing in the Affordable Care Act to bend the course curve in a manageable way. Nobody thought there was. Nobody um, thought there was. Yeah, there's stuff about electronic medical records that they were hoping to save money. And they had this idea that competition and health insurance would lead to money savings. But that's not how it works. But that's not how right. The way you increase your profits is by screening your, your people more carefully. Keep out those who are going to get sick. Who don't get sick. Which actually right. raises yes. costs because they spend more money on medication more money on and marketing. Um, no. So competition um, is so competition a good thing among health insurance. Over the last, about 45 years ago, the United States and Canada spent comparable amounts of money on health care. Um, right. And Canada had slightly longer life expectancy than the people in the United States. So in 1971, we're sort of on a similar position. That year, Canada adopted, Canada adopted, they call it that just to make fun of us. It's their single payment system. <laughs> right. They call it Medicare. We, in 1971, right. started subsidizing HMO. Um, that was the beginning of our exper giant experimentation with competition in health insurance, um, market driven health insurance, all that stuff. It started in 1971. Since then, in Canada, the price of health care has risen almost perfectly in line with the price of Medicare. So Canada has wow. gone okay. 10% of the GDP spending health. 
Right. And they have increased life expectancy by something like four and a half years. And a half years. So they're spending right. more money on healthcare because more they're, healthcare. Getting more they're getting more services, they're living longer. Yeah. We have gone from 7% right. of our gross, gross domestic product on to 18%, to 18% almost entirely because entirely the price of healthcare has risen one and a half percentage points faster than the price of everything else. Wow. We've okay. had very little additional health care services. What's happened is we're spending more for the same thing. And there are two reasons for that. One is administrative bloat. Yeah. American hospitals have about one person doing billing for every bed. Um, American doctors have, on average, two people doing billing in their offices. Wow. Okay. Uh, the, the American doctors are spending over a hundred thousand dollars a year on billing activities. You know, you talk to your pro, your your, your doctor. Uh, maybe it's a clinic. Maybe it's private practice. Maybe it's private practice. How do you do billing? And they'll point to you know, that nurse and that you know, person, you know, person, that's their job. I mean, they're registered nurses who spend all day talking to insurance companies instead of providing health care. Yep. Instead of providing yep. health care. Yep. Yep. So we're spending much, so much more. The other thing we're spending more money on is monopoly profits to providers and to pharmaceuticals. We spend about twice as much on drugs as much on drugs. Uh, we spend twice as much. About, we why why is that? Close to twice as much because we don't fall. It's possible to get lower drug prices in the United States, and the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration do that because they negotiate with companies. Right, right, right. 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 But, but, you, but you know the standard comeback to this, right? I mean, uh, Canadians come to the U.S. to get operations because they they're oh. rationed in Canada and. No, no, that's really not. Safe. Doctors are all moving here because they, you know, don't get paid enough in Canada. No, that's a myth. These are myths that are spread by <laughs> interested parties. Wendell Potter, who used to be a vice president at Sigma, um, was one of the people in the mid 1990s. Sorry, the early 1990s. He has a book about this. He feels very guilty about it. But he was one of the people who designed these campaigns to spread disinformation about what's going on in Canada. Um, right. The campaign against single payer. People have looked at what across uh, yeah. along the U.S. Canadian border. Americans go to Canada to buy drugs, and some Americans go to Canada for health health care. Very few Canadians come here for health care. Um, and when they do, they're often very sorry. They're all waiting for some some procedures. Um, you know, uh, they're wait talking about wait times and rations. We have enormous rations. Enormous rations. Millions of people who cannot get the health care they need because they can't afford it. Um, there was a Canadian skier in, in the Rockies, in Colorado or Utah. She had an accident. Required a helicopter pickup, um, and she was in a hospital for weeks. She wow. had a, a four million dollar bill. Wow. Okay. She did not have insurance in the United States that covered anything near that, and her right. Canadian government insurance only works in Canada. You fundraising in Canada to rescue her. That's a that's a bribe. The hospital. But what did the hospital do? The hospital wrote the bill down to one and three quarter million. That tells you how bogus these bills are. I mean, they just make up a number depending on how much they think they can get out of you. So if you look at your insurance right. form, if you have insurance, you know they'll say this is the list price on the chart master. Um, and this is what the insurance company is paying for this service. These things have nothing to do with each other. You know, there's a whole business. People go to school for this. And then they'll periodically at clinics, they'll pull everybody aside. They'll close down for a couple of days. 
to retrain everybody in what's called upfilling. Raising the diagnostic okay. code, raising the activity code to make it's possible to bill at a higher rate to Medicare or other places. And then insurance nice. companies hire people to go around surreptitiously to find out what's going on. Yeah, so we've got this whole billing war going on. You know, and it's it's incredibly wasteful and that's what we pay for. Massachusetts General Hospital is about the same size as Toronto General, about the same number of doctors, patients, beds. Toronto General has two people who do bills. Two. Wow. Massachusetts okay. General has, has 450 people who do billing. They have wow. a whole building filled with people who do billing. So yeah. we only have a couple minutes left, but I just want to ask you, tomorrow is Super Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, yes. Who are you voting for? I'm still a little undecided. You know, I mean, I'll probably vote for yeah. Bernie because um, I want to keep the pressure up um, on Hillary. <laughs> um, but I hope for the whole campaign, which has worked out very well, even though personally it's been difficult, is that this campaign would raise issues, give people like me an opportunity to talk to people like you and to the country and through you to the country um, about health care, about the need for an economic stimulus, about the need right. to rethink how we view the economy. Um, and the campaign has worked beyond my my wildest dreams for that. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think some people are surprised to hear you say that uh, you're still thinking about who to vote for. I think most people would have expected you to say, uh, you know, Bernie. Uh, well, there are things I, I love Bernie on economic issues and health care. There are things I like about Hillary Clinton. Right. I think she's a very tough lady. And we need somebody who's really tough in dealing with Congress. She's experienced. Sure, sure. We know everything bad about her. I think if Bernie's the nominee, the Republicans are going to throw mud and red bait like you wouldn't believe. And um, I think that would be really just unfortunate, especially if it led to a Republican winning. You know, I mean, okay, there's this but, much difference. But when you look at when you look at the Republican field, though, I mean, they're all economically speaking, and there are many ways you can look at this, but at least through the economic lens, they're all nuts. I mean, Rubio, oh, Cruz, they are Trump, insane. Kasich. Oh Which economic plan actually work? Oh my God, Kasich is the moderate. You've got yeah. I mean, that's how bad things are. When he was head of the budget committee in Congress in the nineties, I mean, the man was in yeah. You know, and, and I think Kasich signed the bill to defund Planned Parenthood in in Ohio. Um, oh, and these guys are so you know, economically <laughs> and on everything else, women's rights civil rights, gay rights, rights for straight white males like me. I think these guys are horrible. So it's really, really important that we keep, keep the, uh, them out of the White House. Well, let's, 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 let's try to prevent that from happening. So I think, uh, I think we've about run out of time. I really appreciate your taking the time. It, You're very informational. Fun. I hope uh, people got something out of it. I got oh. a few pings that um, the sound wasn't very good, so I'm going to have to do some post-processing. Hopefully it'll sound better. Uh, on the archive, but uh, thank you so much for uh, for doing this. Appreciate it. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.